My definition of tastemakers is someone who knows exactly what they want and uh, who are trailblazer in what they do. They create things, they inspire things. You know, they're very entrepreneurial and they excite um, you know other people. But a tastemaker is not like a pop star because they sell their own taste in their own ways. Um, it's usually true more a less intrusive manner. It's something that they own, they believe in themselves, not because they are paid to be spokesperson. I think that's fundamentally the differences between a celebrity pop star and a tastemaker. Tastemaker is, the way I see it, is somewhat living out of the box in life. They don't encase themselves in a certain parameters. They dare to break out of their shell, to go forth to get what they want. I run a creative consultancy called Present Purpose. Uh, we do mainly marketing and branding within the fashion and lifestyle sector. And parallel to that, uh, I also have a radio show called The Lush Life on Lush 99.5. And also a blog called The Present Purpose. And uh, in both areas, uh, I try to talk about things that can uh, inspire people, uh, places to go, things to do and uh, also to share a bit more about what creative Asians are up to. I think one of the most uh, fun and interesting parts of what I do is being able to um, be the bridge between both um, creatives because I understand the way they think and very often they can't communicate what they want um, to the client. So, you know, being able to, to be that in between, um, to make things happen. Yeah, I think probably that's one of the most satisfying. Um, and of course, you know, being able to choose the projects that I want to work on and the people that I want to work with. It's really funny because, you know, I always think I don't have a skill. You know, it's like, I'm like, you know, like I can't design, you know. I write, but eh, you know, not, not the best. Um, but I think one thing I do and I think is that I care. You know, I'm very empathetic and I think that makes me a good communicator. It allows me to put myself in people's shoes and, you know, get, my, get myself into people's heads and um, you know, really come out with uh, something that's win-win for everyone. I don't think I'm a dreamer, you know, I think um, I try to make the best of every situation that's presented to me. So I think part of my growth is actually trying to, to think, if I, hadn't, if I didn't have constraints, what would I do? You know, what could I create? Because very often it's always about working with what, with what I'm given. I started my first gig to shoot for Asia Celebrity by chance. Um, a producer invited me to become a still photographer on set for the wedding game. And through there, I get to know Hei Ren, Chen Jian Zhou, who was my idol ever since I was young. Then we hit it off so well, then he invited me to say, hey, why not go over Taiwan for, for a while to shoot something for me. I was like, oh, why not? Then I finally found out that I'm actually shooting Golden Horse Awards which no one ever really covered the behind the scenes before. So it was a great honor and very good exposure for me. And from there on, by grace, jobs keep coming in. It has been nine years for Let It Be Like now. And now we are going to open up our third branch, end of the year, for in, in China itself. Actually in life, right, there's so many things that move me to what I am now. The thing that impacted me most is actually my, my dad. Because back then I was a Xiao Hun Hun in secret society and stuff like that. Then my dad tell me, if I really want to be bad, just go all out. If you want to be good, just go out. Don't be lukewarm. The advice that I'll give to aspiring photographers will be, everything keep it real. That is very important. Real meaning, real to your heart, to yourself. Everything you do, you need to be answerable. Real meaning like, you don't save on the value, on like production costs, you save it, then you give the cheapest to your client, don't do that. Sometimes really value and money, you need to really hold, calculate correctly. After doing our job, feel the satisfaction. If you really don't feel it, then don't do it. You see, I realised that both of us, right, we started from production house, from the bottom. So, <laughs> how does it work out for you now? I think it really taught me about hard work, mm -hmm. that's for sure. Um, and, you know, expecting to work long hours. Mm -hmm. Uh, and not being paid that much. <laughs> yes. Um, yeah, I think the, the, the best legacy it taught me was really hard work. 
I think it's good that we started from the bottom. So we work our way up, underpaid, overworked, no, a lot of OTs. And now we tend to appreciate our staff more, the people that's working with us. If you try, if you've got budget, we give them more, things like that. I mean, it will create a better working environment also. And for me, yeah, that's how I, how, how I do, do things now. Anthony, I'm sure there have been some sacrifices along the way, you know, to get to where you are. Would you mind sharing some of them? I think I sacrificed too much of time. Time in the sense that because I do production stills, as in like movie stills for top, I need to be away from my family for like two, three months in overseas. I was on a Jackie Chan shoot. I was away for two, three months and I never get to see my daughter growing up because she was only like a year old. When I went back, she really grew up a lot. Mm -hmm. So now, I'll try to do jobs as in like, uh, I, I won't work for money. I tend to work for money back time, back, back then. So now I tend to choose jobs that make me feel better. Mm -hmm. uh, I can get to spend time with my wife and my family. <laughs> yeah. I think the sacrifices that I made were probably um, because I had to drop out of school. For a long time, there was a bit of a chip on my shoulder that, you know, that I didn't uh, get my degree, you know, and um, you know, people would think that you know, I wasn't smart enough, things like that. Um, but when I look back now, I think it was the best decision that I made. You know, um, I rolled with the punches. And um, at the end of the day, I think experience is really everything. It counts for everything. If for me, my, this kind of person can so-called be successful now, I think it's easier for the new generation to succeed for the things that they believe in. I think a lot of people, um, yeah, they're not stuck in the same kind of mentality that you know people like us did uh, in that time. I think everyone thinks that they can be, you know, their own boss. Mm -hmm. They can be an entrepreneur, um, and I think that's exciting. And you know, I'm really happy. There's that kind of environment. You know, I think it feeds uh, creativity. You know, not everyone has to work in a bank. For the tastemakers that I've seen so far, um, the common characteristics that I think they have starts with a spirit, their spirit, um, and then they have passion. You need to have a fire in you because just perseverance is not enough to get you there. Hard work can only get you that far if you don't have talent, so talent is another factor. Well, I think these tastemakers have emerged over the past few years, is, and I think it's because um, you know, it's, there's a change in mindset, there's a change in um, acceptance in society towards people who actually you know, dare to be different. I actually started doing one-off uh, hip-hop parties and then I was approached to do marketing for a small club. So I did that for one and a half years. I was having drinks with my friend one night and um, we were like, oh, we should definitely open our own club. That's, that's actually how it started. There is no typical day in my job and I think that's why I love doing what I do because um, otherwise I, I, I would be really bored by now. For me, it's about creating experiences and seeing people's reaction to the experience. So you know how like I think for actors, they, they get their high by performing to an audience on stage. I get my high from um, just being there and seeing the crowd react. You know, the, the vibe is really good and people are really having a great time. And, and for me, that is that, um, that satisfaction that I get. I think sometimes actually you can't think too much or overthink the choices that you make. I think it's good to, of course, have some to analyze the, the things that you do or the reason behind certain decisions that you make. But over analyzing sometimes can be the biggest hurdle. I feel because the more you think, the more questions are going to start um, popping up. The more you're going to start doubting yourself. So I think it's really important to just say, "I'm just going to try." What's the worst that could happen, right? I'm the music director of the Brattle Heights Symphony Orchestra, the Singapore Wind Symphony, and the Saigon Philharmonic in Ho Chi Minh City in Vietnam. But to many people, going into teaching or going into the amateur seat is basically fatal for a professional conductor. Music is music, you know, and 
when you listen to a piece of music, you don't care whether the person who's playing it for you is an amateur, a professional, does he got, has he got a master's from Juilliard, you know, or he's just taught himself violin in his basement. You know, you don't really care. In my mind, music making should be something that transcends this kind of division. And as a professional musician, I feel that my job is to, to be the conduit through which, and that's where the word conductor comes from. It's definitely unconventional because I bet you there's no other conductor in the world who served 10 years in the Navy, commanded a warship, and then decided after 10 years to go and cross over and of all things, be a conductor. But I think the fact that my story is unconventional should serve as an inspiration. Really, anybody can. You want to use the cliché term of chase their dreams. So can you tell us a little bit about the ups and downs in, in the history of the time that you spent in Butter Factory? Too many to name. The most important lesson I've learned also from, from doing what I've been doing for with Butter Factory is uh, being a leader. I, I mean, with leading a, a team and I think that to me is actually the hardest part. A lot of people don't realise it. Unless you're doing it, I think a lot of people don't realise how hard it is to actually be leading a team because there are so many different personalities to manage. Some people think that it's a very dictatorial job, that you stand there and then you make 100 musicians do what you, are, you tell them to do. The truth is it's actually quite the reverse. The only way you can successfully lead a 100-piece orchestra is to make every single one of those 100 musicians think that they are doing everything so well on their own without your help. It's true, it's true. I mean, I guess the only way to get people to do a good job is actually to let, they need to have ownership of whatever they're doing, their tasks or their project. Because I think without that ownership, the job just doesn't get uh, done as well. Yeah. It's, it's very true, it's true. My experience is like, a, I, I champion a lot of Singaporean composers, like I said. And uh, you know, in Singapore in particular, I'll say this, we are almost like a nation that doesn't have the confidence to say, this is good, yeah. let's share it with the rest of the world. And instead, you know, you find yourself needing to push for things that is unfamiliar and it's a, it's a gamble. You, you don't know whether it will work or not. Yeah. But it's really important that we do it because if we don't do it, then who will do it? No, it's true. Yeah. It's and true. then there'll be no Singaporean music, music. there'll be no Singaporean musicians like the, you know, and, and that for me is unbecoming, right, of a landscape. Yeah. Yeah. With any business actually, it, it may not be as simple as saying that I've got X product and I'm going to go and because X product works here, I'm going to take it with me, I'm going to move to this other country and I'm going to give them product X and it's going to work just as well because every, every, every city is different, right? Every, I mean, the people there are different. So with big brands that come in, they don't necessarily always work because the, the, people, the management running may not be as familiar, you see. And I think it's not just so much living in Singapore for one year and saying, oh, now I understand the, what clubbers want. Maybe one thing we can, we can say for sure is that taste is not something that remains same, right? Oh, taste never, constantly never, yeah, changes. Changed. The real tastemakers are the ones that always have a firm belief in what is good, you know, but at the same time, it's always sensitive to what uh, is popular and what everybody needs or what everybody desires, even before they know it. Singapore is very dynamic, um, you know, and because of that, we have a pool of very uh, different tastemakers in terms of like the kind of industry we're looking at. Um, you know, for example, we have people in the nightclub industry, we have photographer, we have conductor, we have entrepreneur. It's very relevant and especially for lifestyle. So, you know, of course, a lot of people will be interested to know um, the tastemakers in Singapore. Having an interesting experience unconventional way of living your life certainly makes a good story to begin with but to excel in what you do is you need to have that extra something in, in and, and that is tied in with your passion and knowing who you are I've always wanted to help people I had I had I have a strong belief and passion in human development as well as excellence and coming from a background where I myself was a bit disadvantaged growing up and uh, I wanted to find out what makes humans tick. Um, so that really embarked me on this journey of self-discovery and also helping others discover their potential. 
I've always known that uh, deep inside me, growing up as a young boy, there was this little fire in me. I wasn't satisfied with the status quo. In fact, I was always resisting the conventional way of thinking processes. And I was always very rebellious. Maybe that was what got me into trouble in the first place. Until I found some kind of meaning or cause behind the things that I was doing. Only then was I able to kind of channel uh, those negative energy and even experiences into something positive, helping society. What gives me the greatest satisfaction is that um, an individual or a team begins to fulfill its potential and even purpose. Uh, that really gives me the greatest fulfillment. To see someone uh, who had setbacks in life overcome them and then move on to the next few stages of realizing his uh, significance and worth whether he's value adding in an organization or the team being able to move to a stage of performance. That really um, warms my heart and this is what I do. I, this is really my passion. Never ever give up. If you find your true passion or your sense of calling and purpose, lock onto that, focus all your energy and invest everything you've got into that and never give up. Never allow the naysayers to run you down. Never allow the situations or the obstacles to weigh you down. But always move forward. And even if you fail or fall, fall forward. At least you're on that pathway and direction to achieving your goals. Before skinning, I was actually a working executive in um, IT technologies and I jet set a lot. I have a very sensitive and eczema skin. My children has the same allergies as well and has therefore I wanted to embark something bolder in terms of empowering, you know, um, women with the knowledge of not trying skincare through try and error but really know what works and what didn't. That itself um, is the basis of why skinning is started. In many aspects, the job is satisfying from inception time of an idea of a pure desire to create good skincare to the extent where you see the moment when your first store open up, you know, your concept coming to life, you know, in Ion, or be it as far as Spain, as far as right now, the whole Southeast Asia. It itself is very satisfying, not because of um, what it's going to bring, but what we have to offer right now that uh, we are given an opportunity to share the story and that success um, with, with the rest of the world. Entrepreneur takes a lot of guts and you have to conquer your own fear and you are your own worst enemy. This whole journey has been quite self-discovery. Like how do you see yourself as a, as a boss to the team? How do you influence and motivate the team itself? Um, I think that itself has a lot of learning as well because everybody's are influenced or motivated by different objectives. I have always wanted to build a legacy, if you might say, that uh, making a difference in this world. I am wary that whenever I feel comfortable, I create mm -hmm. this comfort zone myself, I know that's when I die. And I need to keep going, I need, I need to keep dreaming, in fact. One of those things uh, that has got to do with envisioning myself or the company is to always ask myself what else or who else needs my contribution. And if it's just about me or my team, then I know that will be the benchmark by which I have become selfish or ingrown in terms of my vision. Yeah, what makes a team basically or what makes a business really successful is of course people from different backgrounds, from marketing to creative to sales to finance and all of us have very different measurement in terms and different strength. Basically in life, I, I think that it's able to really quickly distill down what is your strength and weaknesses and being able to admit when you make a mistake. And I think that that, that really, you know, commands the kind of respect that you require from the team. And that yeah. is very important. Certain thing that you make a mistake, I think it's, it's okay even when you are the leader or the boss to say sorry because we all learn together and we all grow together. Every morning when I wake up, I thank God. I am grateful, I'm still alive, I'm still breathing. Then my next question immediately after that is, what for? There must be a higher purpose, there must be a higher goal. That's what keeps me uh, thinking and thinking. If I can play a part, in that role or in that journey of making the world a better place. I would have counted uh, a life quite uh, fulfilled at the end of my day. If you were have to do it all over again, will you still do the same thing? Uh, 
go through all the pain, the hardship, giving my parents a heart attack during my teenage days, uh, going through so many obstacles and challenges, facing rejection over and over again. Of course, I would go through it all over again because these are the stuff that made me who I am today. And I guess it's not so much the events of life and not so much the situations or setbacks, but really the response that comes from deep within. Um, and I realised these things actually help build substance, help build values and help uh, reinforce uh, the vision, the purpose and the passion in me. When I want to start the business, my boss, my family, my brothers is like, are you crazy? Do you know how crowded the skincare market is? But I choose to believe that, in fact, there's a huge gap and that's what keeps me alive daily. In fact, I've never been happier or never been more fulfilled. In fact, I'm able to share this whole seven years of journey with my daughter, with my children, so that um, it also demonstrates by example that um, in life it's not going to be easy, but it's going to be rewarding. Anybody can be successful, but to be recognised as successful is very, very important. I think all the tastemakers we did selected on these occasions, they are very successful because they are recognised as very successful by the peers. And I think, you know, it, it teaches people lessons that, you know, if you're passionate about what you do, it's never too late to seize the opportunity. I think um, Singapore are now more embracing of unconventional trade and profession. Therefore, um, the stress on the children or the next generation is no longer don't become an artist or you can't make a living. Uh, I feel that we are ready to actually encourage the next generation to pursue their dreams. So uh, in that regard, um, it could only get better, not worse. <laughs>